This video is brought to you by BetterHelp. What's up everybody, Michael here. Have you ever been so mad at something you've seen online that you left a lengthy comment, got into a heated debate, and then, I don't know, like cried yourself to sleep? It's just like when that liar on TikTok said that if we added balsamic vinegar to seltzer, we could have Coke but healthy. So good. But then it tasted like stale Dr. Pepper someone left in a trunk for 11 days. So then I didn't really have a lot of choices other than to let the original poster know how mad I was. Did that make me feel better? No, not really. Did it increase traffic to a post on a social media company that definitely is selling my data? For sure. And I'm not alone in this. Like, remember from 200 years ago when the guy from Fresh Prince slapped the guy from Beverly Hills Cop 2 because he made a bad joke about his wife? Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. Yeah, the event that went down in history as the slap had everyone rushing to social media to vent their opinions. Also, imagine if we were all on Twitter when the TV show The Slap aired. That'd be a whole other thing. What's happening to this country? The weak suing the strong for being strong. The victim's always finding an angle. Guys like me, what chance do we have? Nothing gets resolved by talking! And this happens every time something even vaguely interesting or controversial gets some heat. We see it, we comment on it, and it goes even more viral. Now, anger is one of the most contagious emotions, especially online. And content creators and social media companies are profiting every time we interact with a controversial post. So, are we addicted to anger? Or is something more sinister going on every time you rage post? Let's find out in this Wisecrag edition on why we love being mad online. And spoiler alert for, just kidding, there's no spoilers here, but sometimes you get mad when we forget to add spoiler alerts and it's like, I don't know, maybe don't click a video about a thing you haven't seen if you're upset that you might get spoiled. Just, you could bookmark it, watch the thing, come back. I don't know. But first, I want to give a quick shout out to this video sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a secure online platform that pairs you with a licensed therapist who can help you with your unique mental health needs. And I know how important this stuff is. I've suffered with depression for a long time and going to therapy really changed my life. Uh, helped me work through a lot of things, gave me a lot of really good skills. Really can't recommend seeing a therapist enough. And for other people who might be going through something similar or who are struggling with any other mental health issues, BetterHelp can be an excellent resource. You can communicate with your therapist through your choice of video, phone, or live chat sessions. Plus, you can message your therapist as often as you like, and you'll receive thoughtful and timely responses. Join the more than 3 million people already taking charge of their mental health by visiting betterhelp.com slash wisecrack, and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P.com slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. Before we get into internet rage, let's talk about why anger feels so good. Here's what happens in your brain when you see a post about how comedians don't feel safe doing comedy anymore because of the slap. At the first sign of stress, the oxygen and glucose flood out the prefrontal cortex, where our rational thinking lives, and the amygdala takes over. Now, the amygdala is the part of the brain associated with emotion, and when it teams up with the hypothalamus to get stress hormones pumping out of your adrenal glands, look out, world. In other words, your brain, and therefore your body, is fired up and ready to fight or flee, but probably fight. Now, anger gives you the same adrenaline rush that thrill-seeking does. So maybe next time you feel pissed, just go skydiving instead. Now, this reactive aggression activates a reward network of dopamine in the brain. It's the same one that activates when we see something cute or funny, like, uh, like a dog riding a surfboard. And it's tough to outrun dopamine. Once we get a little bit of it, we're conditioned to automatically want more of it. Being angry creates a feedback loop that's too neurologically enticing to ignore. Now, anger has deep roots in our psyche, playing a complex role in how our emotional processing skills develop as children. And it's not a purely negative emotion either. It can give the illusion of control over situations and even positively influence decision making. Expressing anger, whether you're yelling or slamming doors, can also promote higher levels of well being and lower stress, though it does make you a pain to be around. Seriously, no one likes you when you're angry, even if you think that's like a part of your personality or my family's always been like that. Nobody likes it. Take it from me, I had to work through it in therapy. On the flip side, suppressing your anger can lead to irritability, guilt, and decreased life satisfaction. So we get that anger can feel good, 
But why is being angry right here on the internet so specifically pleasing? More so than say, screaming at your barista for giving you the wrong milk alternative. I have quietly and it's not gonna be loud. Get the out, lady. Well, as scholar Ryan Martin explains, when people express their anger online, they want to hear that others share it because they feel they're vindicated and a little less lonely and isolated in their belief. It can give a sense of catharsis, however brief. There's a downside though. Martin says previous research shows that people who vent end up being angrier down the road. But sharing your feelings online can also have one huge benefit, anonymity. As a study by psychologist Kimberly M. Christofferson found, online anonymity serves three purposes, recovery, catharsis, and autonomy. Recovery is the sense of relaxation after actively contemplating your situation. Catharsis is an emotional purge, and autonomy refers to the chance to try on potentially socially unacceptable forms of behavior without any repercussions. So when you sh post on Reddit, you leave feeling revived, emotionally recharged, and like you're in complete control of your own actions, social conventions be damned. So getting angry isn't always necessarily unhealthy. But is online anger uniquely harmful or at least counterproductive? To find out, let's look at a hypothetical form of discourse on say, Twitter the website that's been ruining my life since 2009. Some of the most provocative, widely shared social media posts are typically known as hot takes. The term hot take comes from sports journalism around 2012, when increasingly controversial opinion columns and shows captivated the online masses. Let me say this straight up and down. I think Kyrie Irving should retire. As scholar Glenn Fuller writes, the hot take is a form of discursive commentary native to the post-broadcast, networked, and global communications industry. Hot takes capitalize on the selective para-editorial practice of social media users and their cultural taste. That is to say, hot takes rely on the hyper-connected nature of social media and on our tendency to be less than strict with our editorial demands for what we create or share there. Also, hot takes was a short-lived wisecrack format that did not lead to enough online rage to warrant continued production, but you should go watch the episode on haircuts. It's the good one and it's very fun. Hot takes often stem from anger about a dominant mode of thinking in society. Whether it's as weighty as politics or as seemingly superficial as Ashton Kutcher saying his children rarely bathe. Now, here's the thing. If you can see the dirt on them, clean them. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point. And hot takes can feel good, especially when your followers applaud you. But you're not always gonna be right. The internet gives us space to wildly overestimate our knowledge and get annoyed when we see content that we think is wrong. And our penchant for hot takes on things we know little about is an example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. That's the social phenomenon where the least competent or well-versed of us overestimate our understanding of a particular issue. Like some of you, when, when you tell me I don't know things about philosophy in the comments, you're being a little, Dunning Krugerish there. But even when hot takes are delivered by underqualified people, they're often delivered with profound certainty. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. An Arizona State University study found that compared to traditional media, tweets tend to exhibit higher levels of certainty and lower levels of tentativeness. And the internet is built to reward quick, impulsive hot takes as long as they seem confident. And I'm taking my kids to Disney and we had to wait to get on a ride because a bunch of 37 year olds are all like getting emotional to get on the teacups or whatever. I'm just a little pissed. I'm like, hey, you had your shot at childhood. When a hot take filled thread gains enough attention, it's often followed by what's known as a quote tweet pile on, i.e. when lots of people retweet it with thoughts ranging from snarky to go swim and dog the pylon aspect is often fueled by moral outrage against a perceived transgression, which a Stanford University meta study found is increasingly common in contemporary public discourse. Paradoxically, that same study found that a pylon is often seen as bullying and can actually increase sympathy for the original poster. Some of that may be because, as a study in Connecticut Law Review puts it, moral outrage also seems to lead people to engage in sophistry or bad arguments, partly because one component of outrage is anger, which impairs judgment and decision-making. So in your outrage, you're probably just making the arguments. What's more, you might be engaging in what the internet calls virtue signaling, 
and scholars Justin Tosi and Brandon Warmke called grandstanding. Essentially, these terms mean saying something in the public sphere for the purpose of impressing others with your moral qualities. When grandstanding, you'll often feel angry or excited. As they write, the goal is to receive a general form of admiration or respect for being on the side of the angels. Now, it's natural to assume we are morally good. According to behavioral scientists Nadav Klein and Nicholas Epley, few biases in human judgment are easier to demonstrate than self-righteousness, the tendency to believe one is more moral than others. Grandstanding is annoying, but more perniciously, it's also often a pretext for genuine vitriol. Tosi and Warmke write that people use moral talk to humiliate, intimidate, and threaten people they dislike, and impress their friends, feel better about themselves, and make people less suspicious of their own misconduct. The prevalence of moral grandstanding may be part of the reason why scholars William J. Brady and M.J. Crockett argue that moral outrage online is not ultimately effective at galvanizing social change. What's more, they conclude that it may also lead to dehumanization of the enemy, which can even contribute to offline violence. That's because it's much easier to get angry at someone than to understand them. As political economist Will Davies argues, if mutual recognition is necessarily slow, then diversion through fury and hostility is extremely fast. Now, the goal of every Twitter post is to receive attention, thus the popularity of hot takes. And yet, the more viral a post becomes, Davies argues, the greater the likelihood it'll be misinterpreted, furthering outrage. He argues, the pursuit of attention is fundamentally at odds with the pursuit of mutual understanding. In this way, on Twitter, he says, misunderstanding and misrepresentation becomes the normal mode of social exchange, making discourse feel like violence. Speaking of violence, after being blitzed with tweets ranging from valid and coherent to, you know, death threats, the next step of the Twitter hot take cycle happens the double down. It's common to see folks with the worst possible takes refuse to yield one inch. You could attribute this to a psychological phenomenon called belief perseverance or conceptual conservatism. According to a Stanford study, beliefs are remarkably resilient in the face of empirical challenges that seem logically devastating. And in fact, beliefs can actually grow stronger when confronted with opposing information. Scholar Leah Savillon argues that belief perseverance, clinging to explicitly discredited beliefs, is ubiquitous to the point of serving as the ultimate evidence of the feebleness of our mind. And if empirical evidence can do little to persuade us to change our minds, angry tweets are even less likely to. The double down is the ultimate proof that all the angry discourse has done little to change anybody's opinion. And then the next day, this whole pattern repeats itself. Thus, as Davies argues, Twitter is a machine for increasing the overall levels of anger in the world. And yet just every day I, I get up and I, and I go into that world and I treat it like it's real and it's, it's been destroying my brain. Who would I be without Twitter? I wanna meet that guy. Now, not all online anger is bad. The Me Too movement, which expanded our society's understanding of sexual assault and harassment, was born out of justified anger on behalf of survivors. The same goes for Black Lives Matter, a movement whose success at raising racial consciousness in large part via social media was a major catalyst for the outpouring of anti-police violence protest across the world in 2020. However, even righteous anger on behalf of activists could have a stymie effect on actual activism, according to scholar Burge Apartian. She argues that digital platforms can cause activism attrition. That's because posting is cathartic and thus able to neutralize activism urges while seldom fueling sustained, committed, concrete action towards social change. She argues that posting on digital platforms can foster a false sense of social agency that may decrease activism by making potential activists feel that they have already made a difference without engaging in further action. Basically, once you angrily post about the cause you care about, there's a chance you'll feel you've already accomplished enough. That might mean sharing your anger about, say, Roe v. Wade being overturned, rather than actually contributing to your local abortion fund, or posting a black square to your Instagram page in solidarity, even if the action doesn't contribute to societal or economic change. But righteous anger aside, it's clear that people being mad online becomes a recurring cycle, even if it's arguably one of abject futility. So why does it keep happening? The answer is pretty simple. Social media companies know that anger and controversy are viral, and they actively profit off of it. 
They didn't invent the wheel here. Ever since the first ship post was engraved on a granite slab, media outlets like radio stations, newspapers, and cable television channels have been in the business of engaging your attention, which often means your anger for a profit. But the infinite chaos of social media seems to amplify anger more than any previous form of media. Social media platforms actively prioritize content that produces big emotional reactions. A scholar Alexander Fisher writes, attention is created by flashy effective messaging depicting controversial, often destructive and drastic changes trying to touch users. Even the most popular content styles are extra effective. Pictures, videos, and short advertising like text that is rich with simple messages and or symbolism. The very design of popular platforms, Fisher argues, invites using shortcuts to evaluate something. That's a fancier way of saying jumping to conclusions. Thank God we're on YouTube where that would never happen because this isn't an entire website with thumbnails of a person going. This naturally is prone to inducing anger. So the design of and content on social media platforms encourages feeling-based decision-making. What about the algorithms? More of the same. Maria Galino, a researcher for the Institute for Internet and the Just Society, explains that algorithms view controversial topics in a positive light because they increase interaction. Unlike crying after someone calls you a, I don't know, stupid bald f online, algorithms don't typically distinguish between good and bad interactions. All interactions are good for business when your business is keeping people's attention. Content creators know this too, and they weaponize that strategy. We don't, and we would never. Technology writer Tobias Rose Stockwell observed that emotional reactions are a strong indicator of engagement. And when users engage with controversial content they're mad about, they also spend more time on the platform and see more ads. This can lead to the promotion of harmful, distressing content and misinformation. Users can boost their posts by rage baiting. And once you comment on something that's angered you, the algorithm sees your engagement and will continue to serve you more of the same, whisking you into a state of constant anger. And this is real. We sometimes notice that videos we put out that, that get lots of angry comments do better and videos that don't do as well, everyone's just like, oh, this is great, you know? So I guess we're gonna try to make you angry in the future. I'm really sorry and I don't want to. These algorithms aren't passive either. They can also literally change the way we behave online. A Yale study from 2021 found that Twitter users who express moral outrage and subsequently receive more engagement become increasingly likely to express more moral outrage over time. Why? Because they are rewarded by the basic design of social media. One of the study leaders, our old pal MJ Crockett, argues that platforms create incentives that change how users react to political events over time. Fisher even argues that these platforms are actively manipulating us and our feelings. This is especially prevalent in politics, where social media posts which elicit moral emotions like guilt, sympathy, and yes, anger can cause moral contagion. When a politician or political group uses moral emotive language in a tweet, their retweet counts rise by 20% among people who share their party affiliation or ideology. And across the board, political elites receive more engagement on social media posts that incorporate anger and outrage. This effectively increases anger in their electorate. As political scientists Carrie E. Stapleton and Ryan Dawkins argue, this anger can be used as a mobilizing force to win elections. Imagine that if people getting mad online could, could change elections and politics. Yeah, that happens. It sucks, you know? So just change your, change your parents' Facebook passwords and don't tell them what it is. Here, social media works as a new public square for politicians to foment rage. It's common to hear people remark that America seems angrier than ever. Well, if that's true, according to scholars Luke Fernandez and Susan J. Matt, it's symptomatic of a broader emotional phenomenon. See, up until the 20th century, anger was a feeling that Americans sought to limit and control, but not completely eliminate, for many also regarded it as a socially useful passion and as an appropriate response to sin or injustice. Anger was visible throughout culture, in parades, protest movements, workplace disputes, politics, and so on. But when the 20th century came around, they write, American psychologists, business leaders, and educators attempted to reduce anger, and some in fact tried to banish it altogether. While anger had once been indicative of courage or vitality, especially for white men, it started to be seen as a real threat to your place in society, in part because of the rise of corporations and organizational society, as well as increased urbanization. You simply had to get along with more people than ever before. By the mid 20th century, most people had learned 
learn to repress the feeling in public spaces, especially in the workplace, though they found places of rebellion like the catharsis of shock jock radio shows. Don't you feel like you gotta pee when you get nervous? Yeah. You're not a gorilla. Like We're like whenever I'm with a girl gorilla. for the first time, I feel like I gotta pee. You're comparing yourself to a gorilla? <laughs> yeah. We're the same. same thing. When the internet emerged, it became the ultimate place of catharsis, where you were free to express yourself uninhibited in all your angry glory. Also, if you're looking for online catharsis, you should jump into the chat in our weekly stream, Wisecrack Live, Thursdays at 11 a.m. We'll get cathartic together, baby. Fernandez and Matt write, anger then has become newly visible again in American life, and particularly so online. We may have to hide our anger at our day job, but we can let off all that steam on the internet. Of course, for the social media companies facilitating our communications, anger isn't an end. It's merely a means to maximize profit. If sadness suddenly became the primary viral emotion, your feeds would instantly seem curated by Eeyore. But for now, anger is simply the most profitable emotion. And while social media giants laugh their way to the bank, while we're over here screaming at each other, they're arguably transforming the world into a much angrier and more divided place. But what do you guys think? Despite all our rage, are we still just rats in a cage? Or is there any way for us to transcend our anger? Please let us know in the comments. Thanks to our patrons for all your support. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you don't mind, and we will see you next time. As always, thanks for watching. Later. Like how your Uncle Rob thinks he's an expert on horticulture just because he used a weed whacker once. If you mixed a bong and a fleshlight, you could call it a weed whacker. Free business idea.